Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Dr. Marjorie Belazare, and the Health Ministries Health Evangelism Department of the ARCLA Conference is very excited to present to you our second health evangelism webinar. We had such a wonderful blessing at our first health evangelism webinar, and these have truly, truly been a blessing, and we've learned a lot. Just as in the past, we are very excited to have a highly sought out speaker. I booked him months ago to make sure we could get him and he graciously accepted. These webinars are helping us to make a difference in our communities as we know. The gospel of health is to be firmly linked with the ministry of the word. It is the Lord's design that the restoring influence of health reform shall be a part of the last great effort to proclaim the gospel message. And another wonderful thing is after our presenter speaks, he will take questions. So prepare them while you're thinking of them while he's talking and put them in the chat and we will answer the questions. And with that, I have the high honor to introduce to you Dr. David DeRose. Dr. David DeRose is a physician with specialties in both internal medicine and preventative medicine. He also has a master's degree in public health with an emphasis in health promotion and health education. In addition to his conventional training, Dr. DeRose has three decades, three decades of experience with lifestyle medicine and other natural therapies. Known for his knack for explaining difficult subjects, he is a syndicated talk radio host, popular lecturer and writer, being published in peer-reviewed medical journals as well as in the lay press. He is co-author of the best-selling book, 30 Days to Natural Blood Pressure Control, as well as his more recently released title, The Methuselah Factor. Dr. David DeRose also holds a master's in pastoral ministry degree from Andrews University. And get this, not only is he a physician and a lecturer, he serves as pastor of the Fort Wayne First Seventh-day Adventist Church in Indiana. Dr. DeRose is happily married to his wife of 34 years, Dr. Sonja Branch DeRose. They have three adult children and one grandchild. It is my privilege to have this physician and pastor talk to us today on the topic of hemorology, the healing powers of blood fluidity. After our conference announcements, you will have the privilege to hear from Dr. David DeRose. Hi there. From the media department of the Arkansas-Louisiana Conference, I'm Pastor Benjamin Orion and wanted to take just a few moments to share with you what's going on in our conference. We live in an ever-expanding media age, and we are trying to do new and creative things with digital media, live streaming, and social media in our conference. We just finished the Jesus Is Evangelistic and Revival series in South Louisiana where every night there was a presentation made from a different church in South Louisiana and our team live streamed it each evening. If you'd like to go catch those presentations from Elder Rick Dyer, our conference president, translated by Elder Leonardo Melendez, our evangelism coordinator, and highly recommend that you do that. They're available on our YouTube channel, Arcla Adventist. And very soon they will be available from our conference website and conference app. Speaking of the conference website, if you haven't been there recently, it's arklac.org, and we invite you to go there, take a look around, see what's going on, look at the conference calendar. We're right now working to get 2024 updated and uh, share all of the ministry events that are going to be coming. It's going to be a busy year of outreach, sharing, and evangelism. The reason you're going to want to do that is because our next Health Ministries webinar is not until April 16 in 2024. It's a long ways away and you might forget between now and then, but you can subscribe on our calendar and get all the latest updates. Or download the conference app. Calendar is there. Presentations like this one will be there as well. All the latest news. You can go to the 
um, app store of your choice, Android or iOS. Search for Arcla and you will find the app. Download it for free. Be sure to enable push notifications. Also want to encourage you, if you don't already, to subscribe to The Lead. It's a weekly email newsletter that the media department puts out with the latest stories of how God is blessing throughout our conference. These are short stories, pictures, churches being built, baptisms that are happening, children's ministries, children uh, making decisions for Jesus, all kinds of neat things. In fact, we just had a team of 40 from our conference return from a mission trip to Thailand this coming Friday. There's going to be stories in the lead about that. It's free. If you don't like it, you can always unsubscribe, but go to the conference website, look for the lead banner, and you can subscribe there and get all the latest news and updates. Thanks for joining us again tonight. Ministry is exciting and it's happening across our conference. And now I know you're going to be blessed by tonight's presentation. Thank you so much, Pastor Ben. And again, we encourage you to please share this link, share the YouTube channel, share the Facebook post so that people can benefit from this wonderful webinar that we're about to have. And without further ado, Dr. David DeRose, we thank you so much for coming here to the ARCLA conference. And if you would lead us in a word of prayer to begin. You're my privilege. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the privilege we have of studying this most amazing of your creations. That's the human body. And we pray that you would help us better appreciate how amazingly we're made and how you've given us the privilege of not only cooperating with you more effectively, but well, helping others to do that. And in the same way, pointing them to you, to our Savior, Jesus. Please help us to that end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. DeRose. The floor is yours. Well, it's really good to be with you. Thank you for that uh, gracious introduction. And it's great to have each one of you joining us uh, for our presentation. We're speaking about a subject that I like to call the Methuselah factor. And it's really a concept that's helping people revolutionize their health. We have a number of graphics that uh, we're going to help you walk through the topic tonight. And uh, we're going to actually put that first one up that just gives you a background of the title. We're calling it the Methuselah Factor, the missing link to high blood pressure, weight loss, and more. And we'll be telling you about a website where you can get more information and connect with uh, some free programming that goes along with what we're sharing tonight. That's Timeless Healing Insights. Org. Well, maybe you've thought about this before. Maybe we're thinking about it tonight, but these devices that uh, we seem to have, I know this may look like an ancient relic, a, a watch, because most people are getting the time from their uh, uh, smartphone or maybe from their Apple watch, or maybe it's uh, from some other device. But uh, the question is a, a relevant one. Are these timekeepers, are they our friends or are they our enemies? Well, I don't know what you're thinking about it, but um, at some point in time, usually not all that far along in life, we need to turn back the clock, uh, not necessarily turning back a timepiece. Uh, we may get tired of the spring forward and fall back routine every year. But I'm talking about, could we actually change the rate of aging? Could we turn the clock back? Could we give us more, well, quality to our life, increase our likelihood of longevity, and from a Christian standpoint, increase the ability we have of, of really serving, really serving the Lord in an effective way as long as possible and as, well, as optimally functioning as possible. We're talking about that tonight as we talk about a medical science known as hemorrheology. Now, I know this may sound very technical, and it can be very technical. There's medical societies that are devoted to this topic. But let's look at it very briefly, then I'm going to tell you why it's important, and then we're going to talk about what you can do about it, how you can improve your own blood fluidity, and what benefits you can expect to reap. So hemorrheology, as you can see here, these are a couple of definitions that I pulled from medical dictionaries. One is the science of the physical properties of blood flow in the circulatory system. The other is the science of the relation of pressures, flow, 
volumes and resistances in blood vessels. You say, wow, all of that sounds pretty technical. Just what is hemorrheology? Hemorrheology is basically the science behind the red blood cell. It's talking about hemo. Hemo refers to, you guessed it, blood. And rheology has to do with the flow properties of complex fluids. So hemorrheology is really speaking about this uh, advanced science that can help us as far as optimizing our blood fluidity. It's really the science of the red blood cell. And uh, if we were to, to simply put this all in a nutshell, uh, hemorrheology is the science that describes how effectively blood is flowing through your system, nourishing your tissues, and removing wastes. And I can see we're having a little bit of challenge with our, uh, our projection. So um, let us uh, try to make sure the slides can keep up with us uh, this evening. So I'm going to do that uh, just momentarily for you to try to make that a little bit uh, uh, better. Okay, so we're going to do one thing for you there and just make sure we've got that available for each of you. So hemorrheology is actually this science of blood fluidity, and we want to talk about why it's important. So there's a number of reasons why it's important. If um, you were looking at a copy of my book, the Methuselah factor, it would actually, in figure one, it would walk you through some of the, the things that, uh, well, hemorrheology is associated with. And what we're going to do here is, since I think we've got our um, devices communicating again, is I'm going to put up a graphic for you that uh, shows you what uh, is in figure one of uh, our book, The Methuselah Factor. And... Um, Actually, maybe I'll give you, uh, I'll give you this first, sure. This is figure one. We've got that projecting for you now. And uh, what you can see here is a list of some of the conditions that have been linked to problems with the microcirculation. Now that list, uh, depending on how large a device you're viewing this on, may be difficult to read. So I'm gonna blow it up for you in just a moment. Here's the issue that I wanna emphasize. Here's the issue. Optimal hemorrheology, optimal blood fluidity can help us prevent things that might seem obvious because these we think of as circulatory diseases, stroke and coronary artery disease, you know, the cause of heart attacks. But there's other major conditions that have an impact on our health, on our performance. And that's things like blindness. Cancer has been linked to blood fluidity. We've also got evidence that things like cognitive decline, high blood pressure, diabetes and its complications, weight gain, arthritis. If we address our blood fluidity, we can improve how we do in all of these areas. Now, I know sometimes I'm speaking to younger audiences and they look at this and say, hey, we're not worried about cognitive decline. My blood pressure is fine. I don't have diabetes. Uh, their weight might even be fine. I know that's a smaller percentage of the population uh, today, but still, Someone might say, I don't have any of these problems, but that's where I like to talk about these other issues. As we get older, I think we're all aware that what tends to happen is we tend to have declines in our physical performance. I mean, this is true in athletes, right? I mean, when does an athlete reach his or her prime? I guess it depends on the sport. I think they've said that gymnasts maybe are in their prime when they're, you know, in their, in their late teens. But look at this other point suboptimal physical performance among the otherwise young and fit. So the bottom line is it doesn't matter what age you are. If you want to function optimally, you want to have good flow through your microcirculation. The technical science is called hemorrheology. Now, because that's a, a complicated term and even professionals sometimes have trouble articulating it, we're going to make it easy for you. You might have been wondering, what is all this about the Methuselah factor? Well, the Methuselah factor is the term I have used for many years with lay audiences to speak about hemorrheology. Think about it this way. Methuselah, according to the Bible, the longest living man on planet Earth. I've tried to be very careful with the way I worded that because uh, those of you who are Bible students know there's uh, uh, some people. Well, anyway, that's an aside. We won't get, go, go down that path. But Methuselah the individual who lived longest on planet earth 969 years 
Here's what we know about Methuselah. Absolutely nothing, nothing about his blood work. We have no medical records, but I can guarantee you for someone to have that degree of longevity, they had to have excellent hemorrheology. That's right. So whether you call it the Methuselah factor, whether you call it hemorrheology, whether you call it health of your microcirculation, we're all speaking about the same thing. And here's what I want you to know. We could spend several hours talking about why the microcirculation is important. What we've done is we put this into the first 12 chapters or so in the book, The Methuselah Factor, but you don't even need to pick up a copy of the book. We've got a free series of videos that go along with the book where we touch on all of these topics, stroke, heart disease, arthritis, physical performance, short videos. You can get them if you go to that uh, website there, timelesshealinginsights.org slash boost. When you sign up for something called Performance Boost 30, you'll get immediate access to all these free videos. By the way, the whole program is absolutely free. We'll talk a little bit more about it as we go through this program. But I wanted you to know, even though we can't spend a lot of time speaking about why hemorrheology is important, I've got a lot of material, whether you want to pick up a copy of a book, whether you want to watch the free videos, those are options for you. So let's touch on a few high points. Why is hemorrheology so important? What difference does it really make? And I want to speak, uh, first of all, about stroke. Stroke is a leading cause of death and disability in America. I don't think anything is as tragic. I remember some years ago, a patient came into my office. He was uh, in a wheelchair. He was being accompanied by his son. He was not that advanced in years. I think he was in his 50s. And um, I had a great difficulty understanding what this gentleman was trying to say. He was paralyzed on half his body. And as his story came out, he had been like that for some 20 years. He had a, had a stroke in his 30s and uh, was still living with the, uh, with the severe disability that came as a result of that stroke. So whether stroke takes your life, as it sometimes does, or whether it leaves you disabled, or whether you bounce back from it completely, stroke is still something that we, I think, all on some level want to avoid. Fascinating study done now about two decades ago published actually in a journal exclusively devoted to hemorrheology, clinical hemorrheology and microcirculation is actually the name of the journal. They looked at some 300 patients. If you're looking at the slide, yes, 297 to be exact. These individuals had either had a stroke or a TIA. That's a transient ischemic attack. Think of it as a mini stroke. It looks just like a stroke, but goes away usually within a matter of minutes, but by definition within 24 hours. So absolutely no residual. But the bottom line, all of these 297 patients, they had evidence of problems with blood supply to their brain. They then compared them with 73 individuals who were perfectly healthy as far as brain circulation, at least as best the researchers could determine. And what they found is there were four measurements that predicted whether a person was likely to have a stroke or a TIA. By the way, all of these measurements are predictors or determinants of, you got it, hemorrheology. So what are they? Let me just walk through the list really quickly. First one is hematocrit. That's the percentage of your blood that is made up of red blood cells. A lot of people say, well, I thought hematocrit was good. I mean, I heard about these uh, these cyclists. They were, uh, you know, taking drugs or, or giving themselves uh, autologous transfusions, you know, their own blood that they had removed like a month before, and they were giving it back to themselves. So they raised their hematocrit so that they could carry more oxygen in their blood. It's true. If you have a higher hematocrit, more hemoglobin, you can carry more oxygen. But the price you pay is your hemorrheology is worsened. And in that very sport of elite cycling, where people historically, over the last several decades, we've heard stories about individuals blood doping, researchers believe that as many as 20 or more elite cyclists died during the heat of races or immediately after because they had gotten their hematocrit up high enough. Yes, they could get more oxygen to their tissues, but their blood was more likely to sludge, not flow as smoothly, and it contributed to heart attacks and strokes, especially when presumably they got somewhat dehydrated during their races. So hematocrit, higher hematocrits, worse in blood fluidity. Plasma viscosity. Um, I got a prop down here. So um, 
<laughs> want you to observe what we're going to do here, okay? Um, I was drinking some water, obviously. Well, that water went down pretty easily, right? If this bottle, instead of um, containing water, had contained honey, how quickly would that have gone down? Nowhere near as fast, right? Viscosity is a measure of the flow properties of a substance. Water has low viscosity. Honey has high viscosity. The lower the viscosity, the better, the better the hemorrheology. And in this research, the less risk of stroke or TIA. Plasma fibrinogen is a clotting protein. Higher levels of fibrinogen, worse blood fluidity, more strokes, more TIAs. And then we have red blood cell aggregation, the tendency of red blood cells to clump together. If they do that, blood is not going to flow smoothly. That, in this research, increased the risk of a stroke or a TIA. Now, you might listen to this and say, okay, well, this is all pretty obvious. Poor blood fluidity, you're going to have greater risk of stroke or other problems with blood flow to your brain. But just how big a difference does it make? To answer that question, let me give you another example. And that is coronary artery disease, the cause of heart attacks. Many segments of the population still the leading cause of death in America and throughout the world. Coronary artery disease has been linked to poor hemorrheology, okay? The worse your blood fluidity, the more likely you are to have a heart attack. And just how much more likely? Well, look at this, really, I find it a shocking graphic. We're looking at some of these elements that I just mentioned. The first one is fibrinogen, that clotting protein. What I want you to notice in this graphic, this is looking at serious heart events, having a heart attack, dying from heart disease. And as you follow people over time, you don't have to just look at people with extremely high fibrinogen levels. You just compare the fifth of the population, the 20% segment of the population that has the worst fibrinogens, they're in orange, with those who have the best fibrinogens, the lowest levels, those are in light blue. And what you notice here, there's like a fourfold increased risk of having a serious heart event. It's all based on this clotting protein that affects your blood fluidity. Look at viscosity. The story is the same, even a little bit greater in magnitude. In other words, your blood flows less freely, more heart attacks. White blood cells, these are not your friends. You don't want a lot of white blood cells. They're like the police cars in your body. Yeah, that might be useful in some communities if you have a good relationship with the police officers uh, and there's a crime being committed, but you don't want these uh, uh, white blood cells coursing through your body in high amounts. It actually impairs blood fluidity and that's just what they found, increasing your risk of heart attack. So here's the point. These determinants of blood fluidity, extremely important. They dramatically increase our risk of things like stroke and heart attack. I could go through this material speaking about all the things that I illustrated for you. Like I said, we have free videos and material in the Methuselah Factor book that goes through all of this, but we could talk about blindness, diabetes, leading cause of blindness in adults in America. It's linked to poor blood fluidity, diabetic complications are. Glaucoma, macular degeneration, two other major causes of blindness in adults in America. And if you look at the research, here's an example about glaucoma. It's the same factors, the factors that determine your blood fluidity, they increase your risk of glaucoma. So if the doctor is telling you your eye pressure is too high, we got to add more drops, maybe you should be saying, hey, maybe I should get serious about my blood fluidity. Could I do something to improve my Methuselah factor? And then I wouldn't have to add a third or a fourth drop. I wouldn't have to have a surgery to try to address my glaucoma. So like I said, we could even talk about cancer. This is one of the more fascinating ones. I'll just take a moment with it. Uh, like I mentioned, we have a chapter in the book dealing with cancer a little bit more broadly than we'll speak on uh, tonight. But let me just mention one fascinating study. This was a study done again some years ago in women who had female cancers, gynecologic cancers. And what they did is they measured their markers of blood fluidity prior to the surgeries for their cancer. Now, the first, uh, the second bullet point on this slide, this is not going to be surprising to anyone. Those who had worse hemorrheology, 
worse viscosity, for example, they were more likely to have blood clots after their surgery. Everybody kind of yawns. You say, well, yeah, you know, obviously, if your blood's not flowing as well, they're going to have blood clots. But here was the real shocker. These researchers found something absolutely amazing. And that was when they measured viscosity and other markers of blood fluidity, the worse the hemorrheology prior to the cancer surgery, the more likely they were to die from the cancer or from any cause. Let me give you the actual rationale that the authors used in their scientific paper, and I'll try to translate this into plain English for you. So in gynecologic cancer patients, okay, so women with female cancers, the combination of an increase in RBC aggregation, the tendency of red blood cells to clump together, and plasma viscosity, in other words, they're talking about things that affect blood flow, okay? So things that worsen blood flow, what is that going to do? It's going to impair the blood flow properties. Yes, that's what we've been saying. But then what is it going to do? When blood flow is impaired in what we call the microcirculation, this is where they're going. It may induce hypoxia in the microcirculation. What that means, basically, in plain English, you're not going to get enough, get enough oxygen at the tissue level. Here's what they say. They say the process is favoring thrombosis. These are tiny microclots. You're oblivious to them in your microcirculation, in your capillaries and other small blood vessels. When you get these microclots because of poor blood flow, then you don't get adequate oxygenation. And why is that a problem? They say this sets the stage where if a tumor cell is circulating through your blood, it can lodge in one of those clots the tumor cell can settle there. Now it's isolated from the circulation because the blood is not freely flowing. That cancer cell is able to gain a foothold and develop what we call metastasis or spread. So the bottom line is if you're a cancer survivor, this may be important. Uh, the book chapter, we also speak about why if you've never had cancer, hemorrheology can be important. So the point is what we've been speaking about today very, very important. And I want to hasten on now to talk about things you can do to improve your blood fluidity. Like I said, um, we could go through all these things about hemorrheology connections with blood pressure. Um, I could show you research that we've done in community groups where people have actually experienced blood pressure lowering when we harness these principles. This is actually a graphic. Uh, you can see figure 24 from our Methuselah Factor book. Uh, showing uh, these are actually three different Adventist community groups that ran programming for blood pressure using these concepts. Uh, on average, people with high blood pressure lowering their systolic blood pressure 17 points over the course of uh, four to eight weeks. So the bottom line, like I said, if you want to um, get the, the free materials, go to timelesshealinginsights.org. We have two free 30-day programs. They're all totally free. Uh, the timelesshealinginsights.org slash boost, that is especially dealing with hemorrheology. And then the timelesshealinginsights.org slash 30, that's what we call 30 days to better health. And that is dealing specifically with high blood pressure and diabetes. They're the same daily goals. And we're going to walk you through some of those daily goals as we uh, uh, go through the rest of our program. Um, weight gain you can decrease your likelihood of weight gain and help with weight loss by improving your blood fluidity but hopefully all of us are on the same page right now and that is the methuselah factor or optimal hemorrheology is important okay it's uh, important and we're going to talk about what you can do about it so if you haven't already gotten uh, one of the most powerful things i can give you um, i'm not here to sell you a book we've got something that's absolutely free um, we're selling plenty of books. We've sold thousands of books, um, over 300 reviews on Amazon. Um, the Lord's blessing the book. Um, I'm happy for you not to get the book and just go through one of our free programs online. Okay. Um, by the way, we've had we have churches who are using these. Uh, just you can just use these free materials. We have materials you can use uh, in your church once a week and support people in your community going through these programs. So again, there's two different programs. They use the same daily goals. Every day there's a specific goal, like helping you to maybe improve something about exercise or improve something about your diet. We have things that deal with stress management in the program, uh, things that deal with uh, a spiritual component, but we do it in such a way 
as uh, not to erect barriers. This is an entering wedge type program. So we talk about things like forgiveness and humility and uh, kindness. So it's not a Bible study based health program. So it's designed to open doors for you to minister in your community, sharing biblical health principles and biblical spiritual principles, but without um, sharing it in a way that would put up barriers to someone you might be trying to reach out to as a, a secular person or maybe an adherent of a, of a different uh, religion. So again, the name of the two programs, 30 Days to Better Health and Performance Boost 30, uh, they use the same daily goals, pretty much the same daily goals, but one, Performance Boost 30, is the broad Methuselah Factor program that we're talking about here tonight. The 30 Days to Better Health just targets high blood pressure and diabetes. So uh, those are two free resources, no charge, and we don't, we're not selling anything uh, on those sites. Those are free resources for you. So if you have questions uh, about it, um, we're welcome to share those with you. Before um, doing the program tonight, I was talking with um, uh, Marjorie, Dr. Marjorie, about um, something that we have going on right now, and it wasn't in connection with this program, but um, we do have um, a special for those who are helping us with Timeless Healing Insights. This is a, it's actually a church-based uh, program. It's based actually out of our Fort Wayne First Seventh-day Adventist Church. So that's uh, the local church's health ministry. But um, we go out, we do television programming, radio programming, and these other free programs. And so we had offered something to our viewers. We said, um, if you make any donation of any amount, uh, this started on December 5th through the 17th. You get it, you know, 12 days, you know, Christmas time. Anyway, um, the, a person can get as much as 50% off, actually 50% off any of our resources. Someone just yesterday, um, they were generous. They, they made a donation, but they got 50% off of 40 copies of Methuselah Factor books. This is a was a person, uh, actually a church health leader from another conference that uh, is doing things with the Methuselah Factor book. So they, they gave a donation, but they got 50% off on all the Methuselah Factor books they wanted. So there's no limit. So letting you know that if you do want the books, we do have a special going on right now. You don't need to pay the standard price on Amazon or on our compasshealth.net website. That's our uh, commercial site, compasshealth.net. And the timelesshealinginsights.org is our free ministry, uh, church ministry site. Okay, so let me give you some things you can do uh, real quickly, and then we'll take your questions. So I've taken those 30 things that we have in the Performance Boost 30 and in the 30 Days to Better Health, and we've tried to condense it into 10, at least 10 things I can give you tonight that you can do to improve your blood fluidity. The first one is a shocker for some people. Here it is. It's donating blood. That's right. There's evidence that donating blood can actually not only help your community, but can help you. So uh, donating blood has been associated with improved blood fluidity, and there's medical papers that have been written on this. Um, actually, it's a very interesting topic. So if you have questions about it, we can talk more in the question and answer. A second thing you can do is you can drink more water. Remember we talked about viscosity? Well, it shouldn't come as a surprise. If you keep well hydrated, that's gonna keep your blood viscosity better, and that will significantly decrease your risk of problems with poor hemorrheology. Some of you, that know anything about the older version of the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study, Adventist Health Study, realized that um, in what they sometimes call the Adventist Mortality Study, researchers back about 20 years ago published in the American Journal of Epidemiology some fascinating data on Seventh-day Adventists. They looked at Adventists who were not drinking much water. There was a bunch of them less than two glasses of water per day. They compared them with those who were not drinking huge amounts, but just more than five glasses a day. And they found that those who were drinking more water cut their likelihood of dying from a heart attack by 50, roughly 50%. So um, this is a huge impact, okay? More, more impact than a lot of medications. So just drinking water, this is, is powerful stuff. Well, let's, uh, let's go on to the third point, and that is eating more plant foods. We're hearing a lot more about you know, plant-based eating. And this is based on really, uh, you know, solid, uh, solid research. Um, eating more plant foods, uh, this is just uh, powerful stuff. So why is it? Why did it make such a difference? Well, 
plant foods are loaded with some of the uh, best selling items in health food stores today. Uh, if you go into a health food store and you say, hey, uh, what are some of the best sellers you've got here? It's likely they're going to show you one of these phytochemicals. There's literally thousands of them. And I'm going to suggest to you the best way to get your phytochemicals is not in a health food store, it's not in a pill bottle, but it's in whole plant foods. So these phytochemicals, among other things, improve blood fluidity. So um, let's take an example, the anthocyanins. So um, I, like to, I, I like this graphic here because uh, I had a grandfather, uh, Santo, he lived into his 90s. Um, I'm convinced he never heard of anthocyanins. I'm certain he never took an anthocyanin supplement. But I know that Santo got benefit from lot of antho, lots of anthocyanins because if you couldn't guess from his name, Santo Puleo, he was born in Italy, grew up in Southern Italy, eating lots of, you guessed it, tomatoes, onion, garlic. In fact, I was in their house many times and never, never did I, did I ever step into that house where there wasn't all three of these things. There were always tomatoes, onions, and garlic in that home. And often they were cooking when I walked through the door. Um, my grandmother making you know, homemade pizza or whatever they were doing there. But um, they got plenty of anthocyanins, ever, never took a supplement. The reason I'm telling you this is you don't have to wait for the latest, greatest supplement to be discovered and be you know, saving money up so that you can get this hottest supplement just when it's released, just eat the whole plant foods. Why are anthocyanins so powerful? If you look down this list, antioxidants in general, anything that's an antioxidant is generally gonna be good for your blood fluidity. Anthocyanins also relax your blood vessels. This helps blood flow. Anti-inflammatory compounds, you guessed it, tend to help with blood fluidity. You can see there's other benefits as well. If you've got arthritis, anthocyanins have benefits to cartilage, the cushioning in your joints. They're cancer preventive. We could go through a whole list. That's just one example. We could talk about curcumin and turmeric and the powerful properties it has uh, as far as blood flow, decreasing the stickiness of platelets, the clotting cells, anti-inflammatory. You can see, but the, the whole point is there's all kinds of phytochemicals. I threw a few of them in the slides here. We've got others in the, uh, the Methuselah Factor book, but the point is eat the whole plant foods. You don't need to you know, take pictures of all these. By the way, if you give your own health presentations or things, I've uh, told Dr. Marjorie that you know, the slides can be made available to you if, uh, if you want those. It's a pretty big file, but if you wanna use those in your own church or your own health outreach, uh, we're providing those uh, free of charge for you. So um, luteins on the list. Uh, we could have talked about lycopene, zeaxanthin, lutein, but let me hasten on to one other concept, and I and I want to mention this. So let's transition from the phytochemicals to something else that tends to happen if you're eating whole plant foods. So if you're eating an apple instead of a you know a sweet dessert, uh, what's the difference? Well. Sugar and blood fluidity have an interesting relationship. And when you eat especially these simple refined sugars I and mean, things like high fructose corn syrup, especially bad, but even quote natural sweeteners, uh, you know, organic cane sugar, um, these have problems. And uh, some of the problems are they, they tend to promote weight gain, which can worsen blood fluidity. They tend to raise triglycerides and higher triglycerides worsen blood fluidity. And they also worsen some, something called uric acid, which is involved in this whole equation as well. So if you go through our free 30-day program, we're going to show you a slide like this if you look at the video content. And it's going to tell you when you look at labels during the 30 days of Performance Boost 30 or 30 days to better health, we want people looking at labels and we want them to avoid foods that have a total carbohydrate to sugar ratio of less than five. You say, wait, wait a minute, you're talking about sugar and you're saying a higher ratio? Yeah, we're talking about the total carbohydrates. That's like the complex carbohydrates, you know, the whole grains, the starches. These things are favorable when compared to the simple sugars. So you want, in this example, more, a lot of total carbohydrate, 24 grams, but only three grams of simple sugar or total sugar 
that ratio is eight. So that's an acceptable item on the Methuselah Factor program. Okay, you're trying to look for a number of five or greater, more total carbohydrate than a simple carbohydrate by a ratio of five or more. Achieving and maintaining an ideal weight. This helps you with your blood fluidity. Now you may be thinking, hey, well, I'm pretty trim. I don't need to worry about this. But what's really fascinating is even in athletes, even in athletes, as they trim down, as they trim down, as they have less body fat, they actually have better blood fluidity. And this is a, a French study of 14 athletes. And simply what they found is that their blood was more fluid the less body fat they had. So even among thinner people. So you say, well, why are you talking about this? I have a lot of weight to lose, Dr. DeRose. My point is even fat loss in small amounts actually can make a difference. That's true whether you're obese or whether you're an athlete. So getting that fat mass down, even losing five or 10 pounds or keeping your weight the same by ramping up your exercise and building more muscle mass, your weight may not change on the scale, but if you've got less body fat, that's going to help your blood fluidity. So let me hasten on to this other related concept, and that's regular exercise, daily exercise, especially important for optimal blood fluidity. And the emphasis is on daily. It's true, the more exercise that you do, the better your blood fluidity tends to be. But we all realize, too, you can over-exercise also and that is not necessarily desirable. A lot more we could say. We have things uh, in the free videos on a daily basis, as well as in the book. Um, we've had to condense it here, but I do wanna give you two statements from the pen of inspiration. These are statements that have changed my life personally. The book, My Life Today, an Ellen White devotional, uh, page 136. Here's a statement that you could take to the bank. Go out and exercise how often? every day, even though some things indoors have to be neglected. And then also on that same page, this is an amazing statement. It's a cutting edge statement in light of what we're talking about tonight. Listen to this. Morning exercise and walking in the free invigorating air of heaven or cultivating flowers, small fruits and vegetables is what? Necessary to a healthful circulation of the blood. What is she talking about? She didn't know the term hemorrheology, but that's what she's talking about. And look at how the connection she makes. It's the surest safeguard against colds, coughs, and a hundred other diseases. We touched on some of them tonight, but what is the solution? It's exercise on a daily basis, morning exercise, especially being recommended. You probably didn't need more information about why you should encourage your friends, your neighbors to stop smoking. If you've slipped back into that bad habit, it's really bad for your blood fluidity and it's bad for some of the results of poor blood fluidity. It's a major risk factor for dementia. That's right, cigarette smoking. If it hasn't gotten you scared about the cancer risk, the stroke risk, the heart attack risk, it is a leading contributor to dementia. What other things can you do to improve your blood fluidity? Get adequate vitamin D year round. You're fortunate, Arkansas, Louisiana, Good chance if you're getting outside, you're making vitamin D year round, especially if you're in the southern part of those states. But um, hey, many of us aren't getting out enough. Vitamin D supplementation can be beneficial. Get adequate sleep every night. That's why we're not going to go for you know three or four hours in our question and answer session this evening. Uh, sleep is important for optimal blood fluidity. If you are not friends with your dentist, find somebody that you're going to have as your ally and caring for your dental health, very important for optimal blood fluidity, optimal hemorrheology. And if I haven't already stressed you out enough going through these slides so quickly, giving you all this information, I will be honest and tell you that, well, you probably guessed it. If you don't control your stress, you'll worsen your blood fluidity. So hopefully we can uh, help you address some of the things that might have been stressful in this presentation by answering some of your questions. Uh, as I finish with the slides, I want to challenge you, put the Methuselah Factor principles into practice. I would encourage each of you to commit to 30 days to improve your health. If you want to spread it out over the next two months, you're going to focus 30 days out of the next two months, you know, with the holidays, maybe travel things coming up. But make a commitment tonight to start on this. This is what I would encourage you to do. Don't wait. Don't say, oh, I'll do it January 1. 
And um, it's really easy. Go to the TimelessHealingInsights.org website. You could sign up for either of the, the free 30-day programs there. Um, you could say, hey, down the road, I want to work with Dr. Marjorie, others at the conference. Um, I'm happy to help you run your own uh, programming at your local church that can help your community go through this. I've done it in my own church. I've helped other churches do it throughout the country. And um, you can always pick up a copy of the book and uh, read if you're more of a reader than a video watcher. I want to take your questions, though, at this point. We do have some other uh, links up there. Um, free advertising materials if you want to do the programming in your churches and also uh, some things about our community partner program. So with, with that in mind, uh, Dr. Marjorie, do you want to kind of prioritize the, uh, the questions? Are you going to be asking those? How do we want to handle that? Okay, it looks like they've got some that are coming to me on a feed, but here's uh, Dr. Marjorie herself. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. DeRose. We learned so much. Thank you. We have some questions in the chat and we'll just kind of go with them as we see them under. So we have the first one. Can you explain what you mean by resistance in the blood vessels? How does that lead to disease? Okay, so basically uh, what happens is a number of things that can increase resistance in the blood vessel. Let me give you an example. One of them is stress. So when you're stressed, it raises stress hormone levels, and some of these hormones actually constrict or tighten up the blood vessels. That makes more resistance. In other words, to, in order to get the blood through your system, when there's more resistance, the heart has to generate more pressure. So this is one of the determinants of blood pressure. So if we can decrease the resistance in blood vessels, that's an example in the tiny blood vessels they can clamp down, but you can increase resistance in the blood vessels by well, think about it this way. Talked about, you know, the water illustration. If I poured this, you know, make sure I get it in the field here. If I poured this, uh, you know, water out, it was going to flow out very freely. There's not going to be a lot of resistance to flow. But if it's honey or molasses, it's going to come out slower. So this is the same with your blood fluidity. So if the blood is, if you will, you know, thicker, I don't like that term, but it's the best sometimes we have to, to put it in lay terms. It's going to be harder to push that blood through the system. That's also increasing resistance, and it's increasing the risk of a number of these problems. Oh, understood. Understood. Thank you. We'll move on to our next question, and we're taking other questions, so you can please type them in the chat. Um, you mentioned weight gain, and how can this prevent or having a proper control can you go a little bit more into that of how that can give prevent the actual weight gain yeah and we'll put a, specific, um, i can add that to as my sure i'll put a slide up for you here actually a couple of slides and um if we can show those slides again um this is a research that was done in um in individuals between the ages of 45 and 64. Um, some 13,000 people. I know you're not seeing the graphic, but, uh, but I am. And what they did is they looked at a number of these different blood fluidity markers. And the worse the markers were, the more likely people were to gain a significant amount of weight. Uh, there we have it. Thank you so much for that. Um, and you say, well, why would this be? Um, one of the theories is that if you impair optimal circulation, if you're not getting optimal oxygenation, at the microcirculatory level, your tissues can't burn, um, they can't uh, use aer what we call aerobic metabolism. Aerobic mm -hmm. metabolism burns calories much more efficiently. And so right. basically your engine, your, your cellular engines, you know, your mitochondria in your body are not functioning optimally. And, uh, and this actually causes you to not burn your calories as effectively. So that's one of the theories as to why there's this connection between weight gain and the uh, Methuselah factor. Right, right, makes sense. Thank you, thank you so much. We'll move on to our next question. Uh, question three, what age can you start this Methuselah factor and can it still be done, you know, this, this topic that we've been discussing as an older individual? Like, is it age specific? I guess that's what the person. No, asked. no, most definitely. We we've been using this program across the age span. We say we say from 18 to 108. 
So I'm an internal medicine specialist, so I don't deal with pediatrics. So we, right. we wait till people are 18. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, if you're 109, uh, it still probably would benefit you. But the point is, this is looking at these practical lifestyle principles that they, they've shown. I mean, they've shown some ama amazing things. This is amazing study years ago. I don't have the, the, uh, this uh, in, in the slides, but they looked at older individuals who had evidence of, of poor blood supply to the brain. They had cognitive challenges, and they found that when they lowered their triglycerides, remember this blood fat that's a determinant of blood fluidity. It's one of the determinants. We didn't talk about it a lot but uh, their, their cognitive performance improved. So if we can improve blood flow, we can improve mental performance. There's other studies uh, actually in the book where we talk about how they actually show people's uh, response time improves when you do testing, if they have better blood fluidity. So um, yeah, no matter what your age is, you can benefit from this. And the program is one, um, it's, a, the daily goals, we don't, they're not prescriptive. They're like one day we might say, we want you to increase your exercise. So we don't tell you, you got to walk five miles or you just have to walk to your mailbox twice. Okay. So you set what you can do. And if you have questions, you know, work with your, you know, healthcare providers. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? I believe we have a few more. Yes. Okay. Uh, with this idea, how many years can you actually take off? You mentioned this at the very beginning, you know, about the the aging and the lack of aging. How many years? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I know some people like, you know, like to throw numbers out there. Um, you know, I think there's good evidence that we're talking about a, a decade or more of healthy living in people that, that prioritize the Methuselah factor. We're, we're learning more and more about the importance of the microcirculation. Um, but we haven't actually come up with like an equation and studied this in thousands of people. I'd love to do something like that if some of you, like we're actually right now, we're talking with a couple of research groups about doing some, you know, actually clinical research, looking at some of these things. But, um, you know, other than just looking at what we see in free living people, uh, that's where I come up with a figure of around 10 years. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. So that, but that's still good. That's that's excellent. <laughs> that's excellent. Okay. Do we have any more? Oh, I'm looking on the bottom. Okay. You mentioned donating blood. Does donating um, more blood or at a specific age affect the blood fluid? You mentioned how that's important, but is it dependent on the age that you donate the blood? It depends on how much you donate. Is it dependent on if it's a monthly, weekly, et cetera? Yeah, right, right, right. So, um, my interest in this topic started when we did the research for our book, 30 Days to Natural Blood Pressure Control. Okay. And uh, we ran across research in Europe where they compared people who were regular blood donors. And by regular, it was four times a year. So they compared people who were donating blood four times a year with those who were not regular blood donors, not donating at all. Okay. And uh, what they found is on average, the regular blood donors had blood pressures that were 12 points lower systolic blood pressure is 12 points lower. And so the question is, well, why is this? And uh, one of the, the explanations is that their hemorrheology was better um, because a lot of us have higher hemoglobins, higher hematocrits than are optimal. Our heart is having to work harder. It's creating more resistance. Our heart is having to generate more pressure to circulate our blood. So you can't donate blood every week. Um, you know, they, they, they'll, they check your hematocrit. I think, I forget, it's like every 80 days or something, there's a you know, 60, it depends on the blood bank, but it's, there's a, every, every uh, blood don, donating, donating center might have a little bit different standard. Some, I think, I think it's, I think, I think I've seen as low as 59 days. And um, I've heard, I think sometimes as much as, you know, 90 days, you know, four times a year, but it's usually, I think more commonly 60 days, something like that. But they'll check your hematocrit, make sure that you're not anemic. They're not going to take blood from you if you can't spare the blood. And um, what the, the evidence suggests is that it is a potential benefit in any age. Um, now, there's and reasons why they may not take your blood, you know, certain conditions or certain issues. But, um, but blood donation can help your community and can help you. Excellent. Excellent. So if you hear that, he said any age. So that's great. Great to know. 
Good. Um, and I think that kind of leads into, we have a question from Cindy. Okay. How does donating blood help you with blood flow? And how many times a year do you suggest giving blood? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that good rule of thumb is, um, you know, is, is four times a year. Um, like I said, some people can donate more frequently and the research that I'm aware of is looking at whole blood. So that doesn't mean there could, might not be some benefits from donating platelets or plasma or something, but uh, the research I'm familiar with is, is whole blood donation. And, um, and the bottom line message is simply, like I mentioned, likely some of it has to do with hemorrheology. The other possibility is some of the benefit has to do with just lowering iron levels. So there was an age in America uh, during my lifespan where people were touting the benefits of iron we now realize that, that iron has a downside as well. Yes, you need adequate amounts of iron to make hemoglobin, to carry oxygen, but higher iron levels actually uh, uh, contribute to oxidative stress in the body. Iron is a pro-oxidant, and uh, there's actually connections between higher iron levels and dementia. Uh, very high iron levels can cause something called hemochromatosis, and people that are iron accumulators can damage your heart, your pancreas, your you know other organs. So iron is not innocuous. And the typical American diet, how many of us have grown up, we're getting more iron than is optimal. So donating the blood actually can be beneficial. Great, thank you. Seems that we have some more from our YouTube. Let's check this out. Can you get too much from Sharon? Can you get too much vitamin D? Well, vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So you can get too much. Um, in the research, too much uh, is probably at least 10,000 international units a day or more. Um, so I typically never have a patient taking on a regular basis more than 5,000 international units a day. Now, if your doctor prescribed more than that because you were low, well, that's a different story. But um, yeah, generally, that's kind of... And, there's, there's, I've, I've not seen any evidence in the literature at that level, even 5,000 international units a day, any risk of toxicity. So maybe you could come up with a scenario, someone out in the sun a lot, you know, they're get, making a lot of vitamin D and then they're, they're taking more, you know, they were already tanked up from the sun, but you won't make too much. You can't get toxic from being out in the sun, but if you're really tanked up from being out in the sun and then take a whole bunch of vitamin D, you know, maybe you could get toxic sooner. It's actually quite difficult to get toxic, but it does happen and you can take too much. So just uh, don't be willy nilly. There's some cases back, I want to say in the eighties where um, they still supplement milk. They put vitamin D in milk. And years ago, they weren't being careful. A lot of the milk distributors about how much vitamin D they put in and people were getting toxic. There, there were people mm -hmm. uh, that were getting way too much vitamin D. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we have another one coming in. Um, Stacy, let's see if I can read this clearly. I need to know about ferritin of um, 11 and iron. Iron has been my miracle drug, physical therapist, 28 years, CBD warder and survivor. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, basically, there's a number of different ways we can get an idea of the iron status of a person. So we can measure actually the serum iron. We can you know, literally measure how much iron is in their bloodstream. Uh, we can measure how much iron is being transported. There's iron carriers in the body. Um, ferritin is a marker of a, a storage form of iron. Okay. So people with high ferritin levels, for example, I mentioned hemochromatosis. This, uh, it's a genetic um, error where the body holds on to too much iron. And, um, and we'll see these people with very high ferritin levels. Ferritin, though, is also um, can be elevated by acute insults to the body and things. So there's some, some things that can kind of make that less useful. But it is a, ferritin is a, an important tool that we can use to look at iron status. And so a lower serum ferritin uh, would generally be a good indicator, um, you know, provided you're not anemic, a uh, good indicator that you don't have excessive iron stores. Okay, thank you. We encourage you, if you have any more questions before Dr. DeRose, to please uh, type them in the chat. I believe we have a few more as of right now. Uh, 
What is the next one? Great. Is there a better plant-based food for preventing uh, blood fluidity issues at a specific age? Um, there is some interesting research going on right now. I, I don't know if I have access to this. Um, there's a really interesting table I was just looking at. Let me see if I can put this up. I think I have it accessible. Um, so we're talking about, you know, there's different ways you can look at, you know, quote, what's, you know, what's an optimal food and, um, you know, different foods have different benefits and different liabilities. But um, recently I saw a very interesting table and um, I'm going to show this to you if we can project it. Let me see if I can do this. In order to do it, I'm going to need to stop sharing. And then I'm going to need to share a different image with you. So let's see if I can pull this off for you. And we're going to share my other screen now. OK. And what I'm showing you is a graphic looking at the methionine content of foods. Mm. And this is really interesting. So um, I don't know if we can show that uh, graphic. Yeah, it's the, um, I'm sorry the print is so small, but um, this is from another uh, organization. This is, uh, there's a disease called cystinuria. If you want this graphic, it's from the Cystinuria Society, uh, C-Y-S-T-I-N. U-R-I-A dot O-R-G. Um, it's at the top line there. But what I want you to see here, so methionine, diets low in methionine seem to have benefits uh, as far as longevity, as far as uh, potentially blood fluidity, inflammation, uh, metabolism. And what you'll notice is there are some plant foods that are better than others. So the lower the methionine, the better. Um, so you can see that some of the champions are apples, berries, cucumbers, lettuce. Do you see what I'm looking at there? That list there, kind of that, if you look at the graphic, it's kind of the upper uh, left-hand corner. The, the other side on the left, these are, are also reasonable, uh, reasonably low in methionine. So you can see, you know, broccoli and grapes, sweet potatoes, oatmeal. But if you want to look at the worst foods for methionine, and this is really interesting to those of you who studied the Bible, the very worst foods, look at the, the bottom four. I mean, they just blow everything else away. Pork, cured ham, pork chops, crab, and lobster. Isn't it fascinating that if you look at some of the, the worst foods from the standpoint of methionine, you, you might be, these are the, uh, there's a whole, we could give a whole lecture on this, but uh, yeah. I, I'm, I may be just teasing you more or frustrating you, but I'm just, this is just one, I'm, I'm not saying this is the be all and end all graphic, but I'm just saying this is something I've been looking at recently. And it's just fascinating to think that the very things that God told us to stay away from right. are the very That's worst right. things. It's not, it's not infectious disease. It's not talking That's about right. um, poor tapeworm, which is, which is the leading cause of epilepsy, by the way, in the world. Uh, neurocysticercosis, but and, it's not talking about trichinosis that you've heard about. It's talking about methionine. So anyway, just kind of an interesting sidelight that, um, you know, the biblical principles of health, there's multiple layers of why God told us to do what he told us to do. And, uh, you know, we start trying to figure out why and think we can, well, you know, this pork has had all the bad things removed from it. No, it probably, it probably actually hasn't. Okay. <laughs> Right. Right. Thank you. Okay. It seems we have one more question. All right. So this will be, okay. Yes. Is there a specific type of exercise that helps more than others for this topic? And how long must you exercise for that to help your blood flow? Like how many um, minutes? Yeah, this is an interesting question. So, so we have a number of things in our free programs, you know, the 30 day programs that we have, these are um, and by the way, they're very easy to do. The videos, the day, there's a daily video that goes along with each one. And those videos, depending on the program, average about six minutes or seven minutes in length. So they're short videos. But um, one, of the, one of the sessions we have, I think it's the second week of the program, uh, we call Get a, it's called Get a Grip. And um, we're not just talking about walking and things. We, we go through the research on grip strength exercise. 
And as little as like 10 or 11 minutes, three times a week, this we're talking about about a half an hour a week of um, a special type of grip strength exercise. We have it all mapped out. It's in the book and it's in the free videos um, can actually significantly lower your blood pressure and improve your hemorrheology. So yeah, it, that doesn't mean that's better than walking. Um, it's just that there's different activities. And I, I do run into people who say, well, I'm in a wheelchair or, you know, I just had, you know, replacement, I can't walk. Um, so yeah, there's other things you can do. You don't even have to leave your chair um, that can actually give you significant benefit for blood fluidity. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I believe that was our last question. We want to thank everyone for joining us at this webinar. We thank Dr. DeRose for educating us. And again, he has all the free resources on his website. He has also made his presentation available. Any questions or comments, or if you need anything, please email me at mbelizaire, B-L-I-Z-A-I-R-E, at arcla.org. We also want to thank our conference, our conference administrators, for supporting this. We give a special shout out to our media director, Elder Ben Orion, for his help behind the scenes, making sure everything went well. To God be the glory. And with that, we'll ask Dr. DeRose to end us with prayer. After the prayer, please stay for the 30 second announcement from our conference. Thank you. Well, do you want to give the 30 second announcement first and then have the prayer? What do you say? Sure, if that's okay with our media director, go ahead. Oh, they're just oh, credits. Yes, I okay. got it. I got we'll it. We'll go ahead then and do the prayer. Thank okay, you. Okay, you know, I, I I am thinking one other thing. If you if someone wants to reach me, you know, go through uh, Dr. Marjorie. You know, Marjorie, you can give out my email if if someone needs okay. that. Very um, good. Thank you very but, much, Dr. Yeah. But, but feel free to reach out to it. And just, I tell people, just be persistent. If you're trying to get my attention, sometimes I'm running right. in a lot of directions, okay? Right. Okay, well, let's pray you together. Your thank you. You're welcome. Father in heaven, thank you for the ability uh, we've had tonight of gathering together and studying how fearfully and wonderfully, wonderfully we're made and how the counsel you've given us is designed to help us keep our bodies in the very best shape as far as clear brains to hear your Holy Spirit speaking to us, healthy bodies to be involved in ministry and to enjoy this life that you've given us. Please help us to that end, help this be a ministry tool that we can use also in our personal ministries and in our church's ministries. For we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you.